the world's ancient megaliths are a source of endless fascination and speculation as to how they came to be. Extraordinary theories ranging from ancient aliens to more grounded but no less incredible theories of the brute force of tens or even hundreds of thousands of people straining human muscle and bone to their literal limits, as well as extinct waterways used to transport the stones. And though it is possible that some of these materials could have been transported by ship and barges on rivers, artificial canals, or by sea, even in those cases, the ancient builders still would have to have transported massive amounts of materials a significant distance over land to the building sites. Even the fact that some of the stones are made of ancient concrete or geopolymers doesn't really alleviate the transportation dilemma, as in nearly every case, much of the materials used in the structures are sourced to quarries that are many miles away from the building sites. Therefore, hundreds to perhaps even thousands of tons of geopolymer material and rubble still would have to have been transported, not to mention the massive amounts of water needed to make the cement. Geopolymer mix may be easier to handle once at the site, but it would still be challenging to transport it in the needed amounts from the distant quarries and more nearby sources. Nevertheless, though some of the stones are made of ancient concrete, there are a great many that are giant natural stones which were simply cut from the bedrock and transported whole. Some have speculated that giants are responsible for the megaliths, particularly the larger ones. I certainly don't discount giants as they are referenced in scripture. Giants are even a reality today, though many of them often suffer from pituitary malfunction and various genetic weaknesses. Therefore, it is certainly reasonable to speculate that some giants in the past may not have had these weaknesses and may have been significantly larger and more physically powerful. A modern giant by the name of Angus McCaskill, shown in the photo here, is an example of a natural giant whose great height and girth was not the result of any pathology. He was also immensely physically powerful and if claims of his lifts are accurate, very possibly the strongest man in recorded history. If a number of men of McCaskill's height and women of comparable height were to mate, then the average height of their offspring would be comparable to that of their parents. And according to a bell curve for height, a number of outliers would likely be generated as well, in which the resulting progeny would be significantly larger than even McCaskill, possibly attaining or even exceeding the great height of the giant Robert Wadlow, who measured in at just under nine feet. So as we can see, a tribe or tribes of giants in the past is certainly not beyond the realm of possibility. Giant bones have allegedly even been found in a number of regions on earth though this evidence doesn't seem to enjoy any definitive consensus amongst our anthropologists. Even still, giants are not really necessary to explain the existence of all of the megaliths. For one, we can simply look to the modern day megalith or Coral Castle in Homestead, Florida. Formerly called Rockgate Park, Coral Castle was built by Edward Lee Scowning who despite being a rather diminutive man, was able to move and erect stones, which on average weighed about 14 tons. That's nearly six times the weight of the average two and a half ton stone used in the Great Pyramids. Additionally, moving many, many tons of rubble and ancient cement from quarries would have been problematic even for giants, as they would still have to have used some basic machinery just to move around such enormous amounts of loose material. Giants also can't really answer the question of how the stones were cut, shaped, and sculpted, especially with such astonishing precision. No matter how much strength, weight, and leverage you have, 
you still have to have tools that are strong and capable enough to process hard material with such precision and detail as is evident in the ancient sculptures and temples. Even supersized tools made of ordinary materials would likely just bend and shatter under superhuman force. And so in my opinion, giants alone can't really solve the megalith problem, at least not in totality. The most likely solution would be some kind of arcane technology. Let's envision a scenario where we had only just stumbled upon their structures today and didn't know how old they really were. We would readily conclude that they were constructed using some type of technology as that's what we use to erect great structures today. But because we do have some idea of the great age of these structures, we normally don't even consider the possibility of sophisticated technology. We automatically assume that the peoples of these times were primitive. But we must realize the fr fragility of many elements of civilization, which can fall much faster than it can take to rise. Hence the earth has very likely met with a number of past civilizations which has simply fallen with remnants of their knowledge scattered and their technological artifact, artifacts eroded and buried by time. And as far as arcane knowledge and techniques, we've seen some evidence that sound vibrations can indeed aid in the movement of heavy masses and that these principles may have been referenced in a number of legends from antiquity particularly implying the use of audible sound to build the megaliths. From seemingly fanciful tales of outright levitation to the stones being rendered easier to lift or move to the stones being said to move by themselves as if alive. Modern experiments show some of these stories could be valid. Even acoustic cutting and sculpting can, practically, can be practically demonstrated. In light of these demonstrations and the emergence of other technological uses of sound, perhaps we can finally see how an ancient vibrational technology is a very real possibility in, in the explanation of how some of the stones using these structures were moved and processed. But this may help to explain the legends themselves but how do we explain the energy necessary to power such a vibratory technology, especially in ancient times? Well, we know that the ancients had a profound appreciation and respect for the sun, recognizing it as related to terrestrial fire and the heat that it provided. Fire provided comfort and warmth. It provided protection from dangerous animals, sterilization, and allows, allowed us to process and bring out the flavor in our food. It is no wonder then that ancient societies constructed entire ideologies around the sun as the ultimate source of this life-giving light and heat energy. Because ancient innovators have harnessed the energy in even more sophisticated ways, perhaps in the energizing of vibrational devices and early oscillatory engines to cut scope and move stones. Is the functioning of such devices what are being referred to in the anecdotal accounts? Stay tuned as we, we investigate these very interesting questions. The device shown here is a Stirling heat engine, a type of engine which converts external heat into mechanical work. It operates by the cyclical expansion and compression of air or other gas between different temperatures. To operate the engine, one side of the tube is heated, creating a temperature differential between the heated end and the colder distal end. Heat energy then flows in the attempt to reestablish equilibrium. Work energy can be extracted from this flow of heat 
just as it can be extracted from the flow of water, air, or electricity, and can be similarly converted into rotary, vibratory, or oscillatory work. The modern Stirling engine was invented several decades before the internal combustion engine and differs from the latter in that it uses the same gas continuously while combustion engines constantly intake gas and produce exhaust, the result of controlled cyclical explosions in contrast with the cyclical heating and cooling of trap air or other gas as, in, as is in heat engines. The Stirling engine was invented by Robert Stirling in 1816 with the purpose of rivaling the modern steam engine, which itself was developed a century earlier. For about a hundred years, its practical use was generally confined to low power applications, such as pumping water, operating church organs, and generating electricity before being replaced by cheaper electric motors. However, Due to the current growing interest in renewable energy, Stirling and other heat engines and devices have made a resurgence, being harnessed for use in hybrid electric cars, submarines, and even by some of NASA's small spacecrafts. Additionally, as it can convert heat exchange into mechanical work in the form of vibrations, its operation can also be reversed to convert vibrations into heat exchange for refrigeration. So the heat engine is extremely versatile despite its relative simplicity. Taking a look at the engine itself, we can see the familiar arrangement of a piston and crankshaft to convert linear motion into rotary motion. We can also see a flywheel which can be combined with a pulley system to operate either a wheel or an electric generator to produce electricity but the main part of the engine is just a simple glass tube. Removing it from the rest of the engine, we can see that it's practically what is known in acoustic engineering as a Sonhaus tube. The Sonhaus tube is a closed-in cylinder which is able to generate sound vibrations from heat. This property was observed by glass blowers who would often notice sound being generated when the hot glass spheres will get close to a piece of cold cylindrical glass. It was described in 1850 by German physicist Carl F.J. Sonhaus and subsequently explained by Lord Rayleigh. We must note, however, that the tube was apparently used decades earlier as a component of the Stirling engine before its value as a audio thermoacoustic device was realized. It is activated by heating it near the closed end. An additional element called a stack is included inside of the cylinder some distance between the closed and open ends in order to better store heat and facilitate the energy flow. It can be made of either a metal wire mesh, steel wool, or screen. The heating adds energy to the air in this region and increasing its pressure as predicted by the ideal gas law. The hot pressurized air will then flow from the closed end of the tube to the colder end, transferring its heat energy to the tube, cooling and reducing its pressure in the universal attempt to achieve energetic e equilibrium. The air flows past the open end, compressing the atmosphere and generating sound. The atmospheric pressure then pushes the cold, the cooled air back into the tube. The cycle then repeats itself, resulting in a self-amplifying standing wave, a condition which we know as resonance. The wavelength of the sound wave will be four times the length of the tube, as closed-end tubes are classified as quarter-wave resonators. As we can hear, the sound produced can be quite strong and it's directly related to the temperature difference over the tube. Placing the tube back into the engine body and we can now understand that the mechanical energy turning the flywheel is indeed generated by sound vibrations. 
This is why heat engines are classified as thermoacoustic devices. This classification establishes a clear relation between heat and sound energy. This is very fitting as both sound and heat are represented quantum mechanically by the phonon unit. There are a number of such thermoacoustic devices. The Rich Geek tube, for instance, is a device that is similar to the Sanhas, but rather than having one closed end, it is open at both ends. Because it is an open pipe resonator, it is classified as a half wave resonator, meaning that the fundamental wavelength is twice the length of the tube. As in the Sanhas tube, the Rischke tube contains a stack made of a piece of steel gauze, but usually a screen. In this instance, the stack is usually directly heated by the source, but similarly creates a convection current. Heated pressurized air on both sides of the gauze travels away from it to both the open ends of the tube, leaving the region of low pressure near the stack and the increased pressure near the open ends. The atmospheric pressure then pushes the cooler air back towards the stack, where the air is again heated and pressurized, again due to the ideal gas law. The sound wave which results is reinforced every vibration cycle to a very large amplitude. So in just these two devices alone, we can see how strong sound vibrations can be generated without modern technology and with relatively few materials. And of course, that's not to say that it would need to be simple in order for it to have been used by the ancients. But the point is that it wouldn't require modern space age materials. Instead, such devices could have been made even with materials that mainstream academia would agree would have been available to the ancients. And of course, if the ancients did have a technology comparable to ours or even superior to it, then it would be even more of a moot issue. I do believe that we could duplicate the Great Pyramids and other ancient megaliths today, but it wouldn't be easy. The Great Pyramids, Namedal, Belbek, and the complex at Pumapunku would be particularly challenging simply due to the combination of complexity and sheer mass of the materials. To put it into further perspective, it took modern sculptors 13 and 14 years to carve the Stone Mountain Mon Monument and Mount Rushmore respectively using modern tools, which included dynamite, large pneumatic jackhammers, as well as smaller pneumatic hammers and traditional hand tools. We can compare this to the 20 years that it took the ancient Egyptians to carve Abu Simbel. This seems to suggest that the ancients were working on a technological level, not greatly exceeding our own as is sometimes claimed, but perhaps comparable to the level of technology we possess at the dawn of the modern industrial age, which included steam power and other heat engines. However, in the context of the anecdotal implications of using sound to aid in the architectural development in antiquity, perhaps ancient techniques and machines were based on a powerful vibrational technology rather than on rotary engines and wheels. With such a technology available, the moving, cutting, and sculpting of massive stone blocks would all be possible and practical. Vibrations may also, also have been used to generate non-electric lighting via a process known as triboluminescence. This principle will be discussed in a future video. It is highly likely that the ancients were exposed to the principles of thermoacoustics during their early work with glass blowing and metallurgy, stumbling across the connection between heat and sound, just as we have in more modern times, and sought to replicate it at will. In this video by another YouTuber using a transparent cylinder, we can see that res the resulting vibrations of a Rischke tube can levitate very lightweight particles or objects, very similarly to the containerless processing system of acoustic levitation that we have today. 
if the ancients observed this, then they would essentially have been where we are today, at least with this particular technology, attempting to figure out how to accomplish it on a larger scale. Is it possible that they were inspired to develop a technological path along the lines of acoustics, just as we have with electromagnetism? A particular advantage of using this system to generate acoustic vibrations is that the cylinders are naturally agitated at their natural fundamental frequencies, as opposed to the electromechanical technique that I usually use, which must be manually tuned to match that of the resonator. Another thermoacoustic device is known as the pyrophone or fire organ. These types of instruments were popular in the 1800s and used combustion to generate musical tones. Gas is supplied to the base of a, of a large resonant tube and then combusted internally with a flame generator. As we can see here, as I place the flame of the propane torch just inside of the copper tube, a sound is produced. This happens because the flame itself oscillates and hence has its own oscillation frequency. Altering the strength of the flame and apparently also its frequency by adjusting the knob on the torch, it can generate stronger or weaker sound as the flame oscillates closer to or farther from the natural frequency of the pipe. The demonstrations performed by other videos are shown here, showing that one flame can result in different sounds when placed inside of pipes or tubes of various dimensions. The sound would likely be even stronger if the heat source involved small cyclical explosions rather than just self-oscillations of the flame. Fire detonations within cylinders or of course recognized as the integral part of modern internal combustion engines. In fact, this particular issue of resonance within cylinders also occasionally occurs in modern engines and is referred to as acoustic instability. This resonance is undesirable in the operation of the rotary engine as it can be a source of volatile vibrations and loud sounds. However, in a vibratory engine, which harnesses surface acoustic waves for movement. These resonant vibrations are exactly what we will want to maximize. Calliopes, also known as steam organs, are very similar devices, which were popular around the same time and operate by sending steam or compressed air through large whistles. During the use of the steam engine, the calliope was particularly used on riverboats and locomotives, which already had a ready supply of steam. They were also used in circuses and were so loud that they could be heard for miles. Any of these thermoacoustic devices could be turned into prime movers. Today, we would most likely choose to use them in a rotary engine scheme. And so pistons, crankshafts and flywheels would need to be added in order to convert the energy into work. Before a vibratory engine scheme, the device could be mounted onto a sled. The entire contraption would then move via surface acoustic wave or render easier to push or pull due to acoustic lubrication. In the video, pushing more than a quarter ton with only one finger the moving magic of sound, we saw that independent of input energy, acoustic lubrication is nearly as effective in reducing friction as the wheel. However, some might be skeptical as to the adequacy of the power output of heat engines to be a practical mo motive source. But we need only to turn to the steam engine to put this skepticism to rest, as we know empirically that steam power is more than capable of propelling megalithic level masses. Steam power helped to usher in the modern industrial revolution by allowing us to propel thousands of tons of building material at a time to great distances over the Earth's surface. Hence, it is certainly probable that thermoacoustic vibratory engines could perform the same job as the steam engines, but without the need for wheels and tracks. Instead, 
keeping in mind the anecdotal references to vibratory technology in ancient times, the vibratory engine would produce motion solely through surface acoustic waves or potentially even levitation. We may recall the recent discovery of mainstream science concerning the negative mass that phonons carry. If it were even remotely possible to amplify the small magnitude of negative mass to practical levels, then this could be, have huge implications as far as sound and its claimed ability to reduce mass or perhaps even to enable macro levitation. One of the fascinating things about heat engines is that they can be made in a variety of ways, from complex designs to very simple ones, but all are ultimately based on the simple flow of heat energy. Another very simple heat engine is shown here with a glass syringe as the heat reservoir and piston and a piece of steel wool as the stack. Arranging it in the following manner, we can create an oscillatory vibratory engine. Syringes of, of course are airtight and so the stack and piston must be placed in space in position before the tip is sealed. Sealing the tip first will make it nearly impossible to place the piston after due to the inner air pressure. The tip can then be sealed by either melting and clamping it or by filling it with a high temperature silicon putty. Once this is done, we can give the piston or the syringe a sharp downward or upward flip and observe that it bounces up and down like a spring. This is because the trap air is elastic. To turn it into an engine, we have to input energy into the system in the form of heat. After doing this, we can now flick it to give it starter energy just as, as with any engine and it will oscillate up and down continuously as long as there is a continuous supply of heat energy. One thing that I noticed with this particular design is that while it demonstrates the conversion of heat to vibrations well enough to vigor vigorously move the piston up and down, the vibrations are easily attenuated. After it gets going, the oscillations will quickly stop if I don't keep my hand firmly on the base. If it is not pressed down, the vibratory energy passes into the surface it's resting on and is quickly used up. If the vibrations didn't fade away, the device would vibrate across the surface due to surface acoustic waves, just as with any adequately vibrating or oscillating object normally does. But the energy density here is not adequate enough to do this. I also noticed that the heat engine made from the 10 milliliter syringe will oscillate re readily when heated with a propane torch but I was unable to get the same result with a much larger 50 milliliter syringe, which apparently would need a much larger or hotter flame, and likely also a longer stack in order to energize this much larger surface area and vol volume. There are ways to rectify this, but as with any technology, we must also look towards the properties of the materials used. Glass is a pretty good retainer of heat, it also focuses heat very well, as with a magnifying glass focusing sunlight. But it is a poor conductor of heat, much poorer than metal. In fact, it is a poorer conductor of heat than copper in particular by about 400 times. And so it is likely that the glass is simply not able to conduct the heat faster than it is being lost through radiation, thus resulting in low power. It is likely that a device made from copper, or perhaps a combination of copper and glass, would render a more powerful engine, as heat would be conducted more efficiently. In fact, a glass conduit with a steel wool stack inside, and arranged between two metallic conduits, as shown in the figure, would utilize the insulated properties of, gra of glass and the thermal conductivity properties of metal. More specifically, the glass separating the two metal tubes 
will allow for a very stable temperature difference or thermal potential between the two metal tubes. This should in turn allow for an efficient flow of heat from the hot tube through the glass and pour a stack to the cold tube. The following demonstration here from YouTuber Robert Murray Smith shows this principle in action. Again, we can see just how few materials are needed to generate strong acoustic vibrations without modern electronics and all from the simple flow of heat energy. We can compare this flow of heat energy to the flow of electrical energy within a circuit as a heat energy circuit obeys similar laws of conductance and resistance. For instance, an electric motor will perform significantly more work when connected to a battery via thick copper wires than it will when using two cups of water as the conductors. Pure water is a much poorer conductor of electricity than copper and other metals. And so using metals of various properties of thermal resistance, conductance, and capacitance, heat flow can be controlled and guided as needed to create a variety of effects. Glass's ability to retain heat enables it to function as a type of thermal capacitor. Along with materials with properties of thermal resistance and thermal conductance, we can indeed see elements of circuitry. Just as we, just as we use electrical potential in the flow of electricity to run rotary electric motors today, Perhaps we can more easily imagine how the ancients could have used heat potential in the flow of heat energy to run vibratory motors without modern technology. But going back to the syringe heat engine, just as with the Stirling version, it operates by heating and pressurizing the internal air, which then expands in the direction of the colder end, carrying the energy to push the piston out and performing work. Once this energy is released, the atmospheric pressure pushes the piston back in towards the steel wool stack where the process repeats itself. This cyclical work energy is realized in the form of pressure waves or acoustic vibrations. We might even theorize that a large musical instrument vibrating at a harmonic of the engine could potentially add additional energy into the system. Perhaps we could also imagine a platform loaded with stones being moved by a much larger version of such a vibratory oscillatory engine. Groups of people on either side could add vibratory energy by stomping on the ground and playing large musical instruments with frequencies tuned in resonance with the engine. In fact, due to the natural elasticity of air, it will likely be possible to run such a vibratory engine even without heat energy instead using only the powerful pulsations of acoustic energy from the instruments and the stomping, though harnessing heat energy to greatly aid in this process would seem like a natural progression of such a technique. So once again, we see just how few materials are needed to create such a prime mover. It is really the knowledge of thermodynamics and sound, which is key. Material wise, the most vital part of the construction is the airtight cylinder, which could be made from metal just as with glass in the model here. Airtight construction involves great precision, but we know that the ancients could work with very precise parameters even on a multi-ton scale. In fact, I might submit that all of the planning and engineering that went into the pyramids, Namedal, Pumapunku, etc., was a significantly more challenging and complex engineering process than that which would be required to build a large scale version of this device using ancient materials. But are there any specific references in the ancient accounts regarding both the use of heat and sound? Actually, there are two anecdotal accounts related to the ruins of Tiwanaku, an ancient megalith near Lake Titicaca in modern-day Bolivia, particularly in referring to how the multi-ton blocks were transported from quarries over 30 miles away. 
It says here that, according to the local Amara Indians, the complex was built at the beginning of time by the founder god Viracocha and his followers, who caused the stones to be carried through the air to the sound of a trumpet. An alternative theme is that they created a heavenly fire that consumed the stones and it enabled large blocks to be lifted by hand as if they were cork. These are fascinating accounts indeed. But why are there two different narratives given for the construction technique of this site? Is it possible that they are not mutually exclusive of each other? One account refers to the sonic energy of a trumpet and the other the heat energy of fire. Could these two traditions actually be loosely referring to an ancient thermoacoustic technology? What was this heavenly fire? Was it lightning? Was it alluding to the heat energy of the sun? Or was it simply a large artificial fire? Could heat have been the energy source which actuated some type of large trumpet-like resonator, in effect creating a powerful thermoacoustic vibratory engine? If such is the case, would essentially be describing a type of internal combustion device in ancient times. Another interesting thing to notice is that the stones were said to have been consumed, but they obviously were not destroyed, something we typically associated with consumption of something, nor were they hot to the touch if they were subsequently lifted and moved by hand. The energy required to move stones of that size and weight would most certainly have required the energetic output of a very large fire or solar heat capturing device, large enough that the flames or light respectively may have appeared to have encapsulated or consumed the stones themselves. We can get an idea of this in reference to modern jet propulsion used in race cars and rockets. From a certain vantage point, it might appear that the race cars or rockets are on fire or in or are in danger of being consumed by it. However, we know that the fire is only the byproduct of combustion. Is this also the case with the Tiwanaku accounts? Was fire or solar heat used to power a large arcane vibratory engine, perhaps in the form of a large pyrophone? Or perhaps even a series of pyrophones mounted into a sled contraption? Looking at the diagram, perhaps we could see how gas at the base of a large trumpet-like cylinder could be ignited, creating forceful cyclical expansions of gas from the beginning of the cylinder to the outside, simultaneously generating powerful acoustic vibrations as well as jet propulsion. With the vibrations minimizing the friction through acoustic lubrication and surface acoustic wave, a rudimentary jet propulsion as a byproduct of the expanding gas could simultaneously propel the contraption loaded with a number of stones in the desired direction. I will attempt to build such a device for a demonstration in a future video. But though acoustic lubrication and surface acoustic waves could indeed help to move heavy masses, the first account in the Tiwanaku tradition specifically implies that the stones floated and were quote-unquote carried through the air. Again, if we merge both accounts together, it appears that this heavenly fire made the blocks not only easier to move and lift, but in some cases even allowed them to float in the air, just as in other similar traditions. This is particularly interesting in relation to two accounts in a compilation by late alternative science guru Jerry Decker. In Decker's Antigravity Correlatives article, two accounts mention curious thermal effects reportedly observed by John Worrell Keeley and Nikola Tesla during their alleged levitation experiments. The passage here describes an experiment by Keeley in which he places a wire or ring around an object. 
The ring is then fed with a frequency or cord that resonates with the mass, enabling it to levitate. But the pertinent part is here where it says that Keeley also reported a cooling effect of the local air when the levitation effect was in operation. It's almost as if heat energy was somehow being extracted or transferred from the immediate ambient air to the levitation device or mass, thus leaving the air cool. The second correlator relates to an account where Nikola Tesla says, I can place a ring around the earth at the equator and move it anywhere I so wish. It is claimed that Tesla built a levitating sphere comprised of a ball with a single ring at the equator. When this ring was fed with an alternating current at high potential, one half of the sphere became very hot and the other very cold. The sphere levitated to a height dependent on the energy applied. Unfortunately, it doesn't say whether the hot and cold region were divided into top and bottom or left and right. However, we do know that when hot and cold objects or regions are adjacent to each other, that there is a flow of heat energy. In this case, of course, it will have flowed from the hot side of the sphere to the cold side. Do these purported experiments by Keeley and Tesla and the apparent thermodynamic effects involved have any relation to the pyrolevitation effects that were theorized earlier in the Tiwanaku story? Do they also depict a relation between thermoacoustics and the con an actual control over the force of gravity? The masses allegedly lifted by Keeley and Tesla were most likely relatively small. And so if a similar principle was used in Tiwanaku, where the huge masses of the stones require so much energy that the heat flow would manifest as the quote-unquote heavenly fire, these questions are even more interesting considering recent scientific discoveries in which it has been demonstrated that thermal levitation is possible. Thermodynamic levitation works by exploiting temperature differences. The article here describes experiments in which various objects comprising balls made of ceramic, glass, and seeds ranging up to 0.4 inches in diameter were placed in a vacuum between two plates. The bottom plate was made of copper and had a constant room temperature, while the top stainless steel plate was cooled to nearly minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit by liquid nitrogen. Naturally, the heat gradient moves from the bottom plate, which is warmer, to the top plate. Because the temperature difference is so, hu so huge, this variation can sweep particles along the gradient. Now we should especially note that these experiments were carried out within a vacuum, and hence the levitation does not rely on the convection of air carrying the objects along. Instead, the movement is due to what is called thermophoresis, the transport, transport force occurring due to a temperature gradient. If this thermophoresic force was in any way related to Tesla's experiment, we might theorize that the hot and cold regions were divided into top and bottom. Of course, this process so far, like with modern acoustic containerless processing, it is, is describing the levitation of small objects. But could the principle also work on much larger scales? We should also remember that just as heat transfer can produce sound vibrations, so too can sound vibrations produce heat transfer. Is this the effect that both Keeley and Tesla were observing since Keeley used acoustic vibrations and Tesla electrical vibrations? And if so, then were these thermal effects the cause of movement of the masses or simply the byproduct? We should also recall once more that both heat and sound are represented by the phonon and that phonons have been demonstrated to carry negative mass, meaning that they tend to rise within a gravitational field. 
These are certainly fascinating questions and concepts that deserve further investigation. But it all begs the question, what did the ancients know? And just how sophisticated was their knowledge of energy? Well, we certainly know that the ancients had a practical knowledge of both thermodynamics and acoustics. Regarding thermodynamics, the ancients were very familiar with utilizing heat energy from fire and from the sun. We also know that they could produce cooler temperatures using special clay pots of various designs. The Hindi Matki, the Egyptian Kula, for example, along with many other such pots found in the Indus Valley, in Egypt, and in the rest of Africa, are all examples of such pots, which could keep foods and liquids cool without modern technology, using the process of evaporative cooling. Evaporative cooling is based on the thermodynamics of the evaporation of water, or the changing from the liquid phase into the vapor phase. When the warm contents of a container are surrounded by water, which subsequently evaporates, heat energy is removed, leaving the contents of the container at a significantly lower temperature. But evaporative cooling can also be achieved through the use of wind. This was realized in architectural elements called wind catchers that were used in Egypt and Persia thousands of years ago. They were built in the form of wind shafts on the roofs of buildings. The cooling pots and wind catchers both involve the exchange and transfer of heat energy and thus emphatically proves that the ancients had a sophisticated and practical knowledge of thermodynamics. This type of cooling is so cost effective and dependable that it is still used in many arid regions today, though they are sometimes used in conjunction with modern electric fans for enhanced effectiveness. And regarding acoustics, there's also ample evidence of the ancients' understanding of sound engineering. We see undeniable evidence of this in such ancient structures as the Great Pyramid of Chichen Itza in Yucatan, Mexico. Clapping in the direction of this ancient Mayan temple produces an echo which sounds like the chirp of the local Quetzal bird. We also see the application of this knowledge in the Greek amphitheater at Epidaurus, which was constructed in the 4th century BC. The acoustic properties relied on the detailed de geometry of the seating area and was said to be of such quality that even in the back row, the audience could hear crystal clear speech from the performers on stage. And this over 2000 years before the invention of microphones and loudspeakers. Notice how the entire theater itself is shaped like a giant sound amplifying parabolic dish that is facing upward. What we do today with space age metals and materials, the ancients did with large amounts of stone. In these times of discord, fear is rampant in our society. I contend that the flip side of fear is understanding, and those who travel will reap great understanding by meeting people who find other truths to be self-evident and God-given. Similar acoustic feats have also been found in the Malta Hypogeum, the King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid, and even Stonehenge. In fact, concerning the latter, recent studies have shown that the stones of Stonehenge were intentionally arranged to amplify sounds within the circle while simultaneously and incredibly mitigating the sound to observers outside the circle, as well as keeping out external sounds. Again, all achieved without modern electronics. As far as being able to manipulate and form metals to produce parts for thermoacoustic devices, more and more evidence is being found that the ancients could achieve this much earlier than previously believed. Iron, bronze, and copper artifacts have all been found in the Great Pyramid of Giza, providing evidence of metallurgy in Egypt as far back as 5,000 years ago during the Old Kingdom. 
and discoveries of ancient mines and furnaces elsewhere on Earth show that metallurgy as a practice has existed even further back, at least as far as 5,000 BC or 7,000 years ago. Metalworking would have gradually been extended from producing tools to musical instruments to perhaps even large cylinders. 5,000 year old metallic cylinders the size of modern straws had definitely been found and much larger pipe-like cylinders have been claimed, though the supporting evidence thus far is inconclusive. Therefore, it shouldn't be surprising that there is evidence of mechanization in the ancient world. For instance, the first recorded rudimentary steam engine was the Aeoli Pau, mentioned by Roman architect and engineer Vitruvius between 30 and 15 BC. The device and principles were later described and perhaps constructed by the Greek Egyptian mathematician and engineer Heron of Alexandria in the following century during the Roman period of Egypt. What's also interesting is that many have credited Heron with the invention of the Aeoli Pau, even though it was mentioned by Vitruvius several decades earlier. It also seems that Vitruvius himself was not the inventor. Instead, the implication is that the concept of steam propulsion goes much further back, perhaps many centuries earlier. This deduction seems to be supported by the fact that some of Heron's work is a studious compilation of knowledge and concepts passed down from ancient Egypt and ancient Babylon, the latter which has been considered as the center of Mesopotamian civilization from roughly 2000 BC to 540 BC, giving us a rough idea of just how old these concepts actually are. Apparently, these much earlier teachings inspired a variety of Heron's mechanical creations, which included singing birds, puppets, coin-operated machines, a fire engine, a water organ, and various devices known as automata which are machines operated by mechanical or pneumatic means and often employed as temple miracles. This work is cited by Pappas of Alexandria, as is also the Barocas, or methods of lifting heavy weights. Mechanica is based on the work of Archimedes, who also studied at the Library of Alexandria and presents a wide range of engineering principles, including a theory of motion, a theory of balance, methods of lifting and transporting heavy objects with mechanical devices, and how to calculate the center of gravity for very simple shapes. And so we can plainly see that the concept of heat energy, including steam, as well as a number of mechanical devices are not solely a result of our modern age. Instead, these concepts go back thousands of years very possibly before even ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt. It also brings up another interesting point, and that is that the Aeoli Pau is not the direct ancestor of the modern steam engine. In other words, the modern steam engine is an independent invention and is separated from the Aeoli Pau by at least 2,000 years, thus proving that different peoples from different cultures and vastly different eras could indeed come up with similar concepts and ideas. For th those who believe that these ancient feats could only have been achieved by aliens or with the help of, help of aliens, consider this. If, if ETs were visiting Earth, we have to consider that they had independently discovered all of the same laws of motion and relativity as we have, and much, much more. Though they would likely be vastly different from us, they would have to have developed vastly similar concepts. This follows as mathematics, for instance, is a universal language. And so should it be so difficult to consider the possibility that our own ancient ancestors likewise also independently conceptualized and developed mechanized tools, conveyances, and other tech which we typically ascribe only to our own age, 
These realizations make the existence of an ancient thermoacoustic technology much more plausible, perhaps allowing us to view tra traditions such as the one from Tiwanaku from a different perspective. And so the question is, are these accounts of moving the Tiwanaku stones, for instance, as described, 100% factual? Are they complete fabrication? Or are they a mixture of myth and fact? Many ancient societies were founded on oral cultures and hence passed on information and knowledge via song, symbology, and stories. And as such, the blending of legend and actual occurrences may have easily happened. With oral storytelling, there can be a merging and even an embellishment of certain details, just as we often see with the propagation of rumors. Repeated renderings of stories and, and accounts may often involve certain embell embellishments and added details by storytellers in order to breathe new life into the stories or even reframings to make the stories more relevant to the time or situation at hand. Such reframings could involve the, the transition from technological elements to magical elements, for instance. Is this the case with the Tiwanaku traditions mentioned earlier? Do these tales of magic actually contain elements of a very real thermoacoustic technology in antiquity? It is certainly an intriguing thought, at the very least. such monstrous weights as those used in some of the ancient megaliths would still strain the power of even the mightiest modern internal combustion engines. This would likely hold true for huge thermoacoustic engines as well. But since a thermoacoustic vibratory engine would move via surface acoustic waves, are there ways that this vibratory energy could be gradually developed and stored for later release for a much larger increasing acoustic power output, perhaps through resonance. In the next video, we will attempt to answer this question by seeing how vibrational energy may be stored and greatly amplified in order to perform work in a video which will be entitled Acoustic Capacitors. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. And as always, stay tuned.